Hey, I'm excited this morning. Uh, I've got, uh, we've got a guest preacher. He's not really a guest. He's a part of us. Actually, he's a bigger part of us than what you know until now. Ken Turner and his wife Jennifer have been attending the pasture since, oh, sometime last year. And uh, I've known Ken for decades, uh, been a part of uh, ministering with him, have been a beneficiary of the ministry that he's had for years as a pastor, as a youth pastor. He's got a ministry called High Impact Ministries, and he ministers to the fatherless, and he uh, does studies for our youth in the juvenile detention centers. Just a wonderful servant of God, a true friend, somebody that can come alongside of me in the ministry to encourage me and to hold me accountable, and I'm glad for that. I'm just glad he's here, and we've actually put him and Jeff Williamson on staff part-time here at the church as associate pastor. So I didn't want to waste any time. I was like, well, you're on staff now, so I'm taking this week off. How about that? The crappies are biting, so peace out. No, I uh, actually, we kind of intended to be gone this last week, but because of some personal circumstances, we ended up staying around. And I'm glad because I want to hear Ken preach, and he's going to come preach for us in a minute. Uh, Ken is going to be uh, sort of heading up our discipleship initiatives here at the pasture. Also, maybe if we want to give him a title, we'll call him the pastor of kingdom engagement. You say, Mick, what is that? I don't know yet, but it sounded like a cool title, so we started with that. Now, actually, what I mean when I say that is that uh, part of what Ken will do is to help connect God's people here at the pasture with the kingdom opportunities that are all around us, within the church, outside of our church locally, maybe even some stuff abroad. So lots to figure out, lots to sort out. I'm just super glad that he's here, and I'm super glad, Ken, that you're going to preach to us this morning. You using the Bible? Okay, I forgot to check, so that's good. Come on up, Ken. Everybody give Ken a good warm welcome. <laughs> Same squawk you gave me. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. The force is still here. Yes. All right. Thanks, Mick. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to uh, John chapter 11. We're going to be looking at a passage of scripture today, a really interesting story in the, the book of John and chapter 11. And to tell you the truth, I was reading, I've been doing a study in the book of John for quite some time. And one of the best pieces of advice that I could ever give you in your spiritual walk is if you want to read through the Bible every year, then I'm all for that. More power to you. If you want to read through the Bible uh, two or three times a year, then, then praise the Lord. And I hope, that, uh, I hope that really benefits you spiritually. But I decided to do something a few years ago, and I'm saying this as a, Mick, as a man of the cloth. <laughs> I'm giving you permission that you don't really have to get in that big of a hurry. I mean, Jesus is coming soon, but he may not be coming that soon. So you can take your Bible and really read and study and go deep and comprehend the, what God is really saying to you. And so a few years ago, I just decided I'm tired of being in such a hurry when it comes to my walk with the Lord. And so I decided to do a reading through the book of Psalms. And, um, and I, this, is, this was the, sort of the principle that I decided to follow is I'm just going to read until something speaks to me. And I'm going to stop, and I'm going to meditate, and I'm going to ask questions of the Lord. And so, what are you saying here? What are you telling me? What are you trying to tell me? What do I need to know and learn and, and apply? So what I found out is that a lot of times I was reading three or four or five verses. So it took me a year and a half to read through the book of Psalms because I was just going slow. So a while back, I started doing the same thing in the book of John. And I am past John 11, but not long ago, and I've been in this for a while, but not long ago, I, I got kind of hung up in a passage of scripture in John 11. And it was a story that we've all heard before. We heard it in Sunday school. We heard it in, you know, children's church. But it's a story about this guy that died, Lazarus. Now, if you've been in church at all, you know, throughout your life, or if you haven't, and this is all new to you, that's okay too. But this is a really unusual story because it's not common that someone die, you know, and come back. 
Well, except Jesus, and we all know about that story, but, but this man, Lazarus, he actually died, and then he came back four days later. Now, what I want to, I don't know what the title of this should be. I came up with multiple titles, um, but the one I kind of landed on is Surviving the Worst of the Worst. Because, you know, when you read the story of Lazarus in John chapter 11, uh, one of the things that really jumped out at me is that I'm reading about this thing that happened. Um, a man got sick. He has two sisters, Mary and Martha. They all live together, the three of them in the same house. And Lazarus is probably the oldest brother. He probably owns the house and his sisters live with him, you know. So those of you that are still 27 or 30 and you still live with your parents, you're not, this isn't new. And so they're all still living together. And Lazarus got sick. And then, and, and you'll see the story as we get into it, but then he died. But, but as I got into the story, I, I, it kind of got puzzling to me. Because I began to realize that there is, there is very little that Jesus teaches us about Lazarus. I mean, we don't hardly know anything about how did he get sick? What, what Was it a fever? Was it some other illness? Um, was it his heart? Was it a stroke? Was it, you know, was it COVID? I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, what happened to this guy? And because he was sick, and they said he fell asleep, and then they said, and then he died. But Jesus doesn't really talk much about Lazarus at all. Because I think this is the point of the passage of Scripture for us today. It's not so much about Lazarus. It's about people like you and me who walk with the Lord, like Mary and Martha. People like you and me, that, like his disciples that were walking with him, because they're a big part of the story. It's really about people like you, me, disciples, who know Jesus, love Jesus. Uh, we walk close to Jesus, and for some reason, we feel like right now, we're experiencing the worst of the worst. You know, we've all got you know, news that something, something seems a little off. And then you kind of wonder, you know, like we were trying to sell our house in Tennessee. Well, we did sell our house in Tennessee and we moved here in October, but in the middle of trying to sell our house, um, everything started going wrong. And uh, has this ever happened to you where everything starts going wrong? One day I walked I was down the driveway mowing, and it was pretty dry. We hadn't had rain for a while, but there was a huge wet spot down at the bottom of our driveway. We lived up on a hill, you know, near mountains, kind of like Woodford County. It looks a lot like this. <laughs> so so uh, anyway, so, you know, I was walking, I was riding the lawnmower down the driveway, and there was this wet spot. And you know how it is. You kind of think, hmm, that's interesting. Uh, did we have rain lately? That's probably all it is. Well, then I realized we hadn't had rain lately. And so sure enough, you know, the little wet spot turns into a water line that had broken. And then I find out that it's up to me to fix it. And then I find out that, you know, all the expense and all the, and you, you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes, you know, you just have a little pain, a little sniffle, a little glitch. And in your mind, you're thinking, well, this is nothing. And then the next thing you hear is that, no, it is a little bit of something. And then the next thing you hear is it's a little bit more than just a little bit of something. And before you know it, everything is spiraling. And you go from life is okay to life is turning into the worst of the worst. So we used to live in Indianapolis years ago, and I was a youth pastor there. We were there for 20, we were in Indiana 21 years, and I was a youth pastor there. And we started this youth outreach ministry, and I got really involved in some things in the community, which, again, was one of the best moves of my ministry life, was to really get engaged in the community. And so I was asked sometimes to come over to the Indianapolis Colts facility and speak at an event um, led by an organization called All Pro Dad. Now, Tony Dungy was the coach for the Colts back then. And uh, Peyton Manning was the quarterback for the Col Colts back then. And, and if any of you are followed anything about the Colts. That was a tremendous decade. And so I would go over to the Colts facility once or twice a year where they would have this big all-pro dad. It was a faith-based organization where fathers would come in with their kids, and, and there would be about 2,000 people there. So I would speak. I was one person that would speak among many people. 
And uh, Tony Dungy would be there and, and some of the other coaches and players. And so, you know, you bring your kids. So I brought our son, Brett. He was in junior high. Well, there's nothing more unpredictable than going to something with your junior high son or daughter. <laughs> and so, of course, I asked him if he wanted to bring a friend. We have two daughters and a son. And, you know, so Brett doesn't have a brother. So he, he invited his buddy, Grayson. And uh, Grayson was almost like the brother that he didn't have back then. And so Grayson was funny and a little squirrely. So while we were running around before everything started, Brett and Grayson were running around, which was fine. But eventually you kind of start getting the sense that some of the other adult volunteers, you know, maybe they weren't appreciating the, the squirreliness of these two junior high boys. And so I found them and I said, hey, maybe there's something you can help do you know, just to make, get them busy. So these, these older women, they were like grandmother women, a whole group of them were at a big, long table. And they were putting plastic water bottles that had the logo on it. They were taking them out of these big boxes, and each one was in a plastic sleeve for shipping. They were pulling the sleeves. There were 2,000 of these. So they were pulling the sleeves off the bottle, they were setting the bottle on a table in just perfect rows, you know, rows and columns. So imagine this folding table with, and multiple folding tables, with these water bottles, and they were just stacked in perfect rows. And Brett and Grayson thought, well, this is, this is not beyond the ability of a junior hire. <laughs> so they started pulling water bottles out of the box and setting them on the table and and, uh, you know, when you're an older person, you want things done um, the right way. And so they were looking at how perfectly lined up they were. And you could tell that while we appreciate your heart, we don't need your help was kind of the vibe I was getting. And so Grayson turns around and uh, he's pretty squirrely, but he wasn't trying to be squirrely right then. But it doesn't matter because your reputation kind of skews what people think about you. So he turns around and, and without not on purpose, he, he turns around and he barely bumps the corner of the table and he steps away and you could see the look on everybody's face because it's kind of like my water line break or your, your call from the doctor's office or your noise under the hood of your car. It's like, this is nothing, right? Just one water bottle starts wobbling and you could see the look on his face because it bumps another one and it starts wobbling and wobbling, and more of them start wobbling. And before you know it, Grayson is literally just screaming with his hands in the air going, no, 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 no. And all the water bottles, <laughs> like dominoes, all start falling down. Needless to say, um, the ladies didn't need their help anymore. And they made that really, really clear. <laughs> and so, but that picture kind of reminds me sometimes of how we feel about our life. You know, we look at our life and we think, you know, I'm, I'm doing pretty well. I'm walking with Jesus. I'm, I'm walking. My heart is warm toward him. And I really sense that his heart is warm toward me. We don't have any, uh, I don't have any bitterness. I don't have any anger. I don't have any big questions about his motives or timing or anything. So why, all of a sudden, some little thing pops up on my radar and right now, it looks like it's getting worse and worse and worse. So what's the worst thing that could happen? Well, the worst thing that could happen with Lazarus, and we'll look at the passage here, is that he got sick. And what could be worse than that? He gets sicker. And what could be worse than that? He doesn't make it. And surely that's not going to happen. But that is what happened for them. And you know, Mick, I don't know if you ever think about this, but I mean, we're all going to go someday, right? Unless Jesus comes. I will. Yeah, but I have some news for you. <laughs> so there's been a lot of research over the last two or three years about how people want to go, right? And how they want to be buried and how they want to go. I guess people are thinking about that more. And so the most recent survey in 2022, those 1,500 people were surveyed in this study and about 35% of people would just as soon have a traditional burial, you know, that kind of makes sense to me. And about 35 or so percent of people um, 
now are saying they would just as soon be cremated. So it's about 30, you know, about the same number, about 35% each way. And then there's about 10% that just say, I don't really care. You know, I'm gone anyway, and I, I don't care what they do. Um, there's only about 7% that want their body to be donated to science. But then there's some people that are coming up with other creative ways. Some people are wanting to do sports-themed funerals. So, you know, they want everybody to dress in their uh, jerseys of their favorite team, and, and they want their casket to have the logo on it, and, and it's kind of like Mick. They just want the Packers to let them down one more time, you know, right there at the very end. <laughs> and so, but then there's this thing, <laughs> there's this thing called a Viking funeral. This is where you come in. So I read about this, and I actually looked it up. In the United Kingdom, you can order uh, the whole package. You can order the Viking funeral package for $752 plus shipping. We can have Viking caskets shipped over here about two to four days. I think that's pretty important because if we're already dead, we need to get them here soon. And uh, so the whole Viking funeral is, um, you know, they put you on the, in the Viking, the wooden Viking little boats and uh, out on Evergreen Lake, we're just going to shove you out across the water <laughs> and, uh, and it's going to be so cool. I got, I, I put you and me in there. Weird, though, your order number is ahead of mine, and I'm not really sure why that, <laughs> why that is. But, but then the big question is, Mick likes to pick on people, so who's going to shoot the flaming arrow, you know, out there over the lake? I'm not really sure. Oh, I've, only, I've, only, <laughs> I've only been here a few months, so I think right now it's between a guy named Daryl, a guy named Brett, or Jill. I'm not really sure, but <laughs> somebody's going to shoot the flaming arrow. Um, so... What happens when it's the worst of the worst has taken place? So look with me at John chapter 11. Let's, um, let's read a little bit of the passage. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, from the village of uh, Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who just, this is a reminder, it was Mary who had just recently anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. And it was her whose brother Lazarus who was ill. So the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the son of man may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? And Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas called the, tw called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go that we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she, sent him to, she, sent, she went in to meet him, but Mary remained seated in the house, and Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, he will give it to you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection in the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. And we're going to stop right there. I want to break this down. There were, when, when God allows you to go through the worst of the worst, there are several things that we struggle with as children of God. 
And there, there are several powerful truths that come out of this passage of Scripture that I want you to grasp today. Because even though we may be, maybe we have been through, but we're not going through it now. Now we're doing fine. Or we are currently going through the worst of the worst. Um, or we feel like that it's, it's looming in our future something far worse than what we are experiencing right now. Whatever stage you are in life, this truth of how they processed the providence of God, the sovereignty of Jesus Christ and his ability to make the right choices, do the right thing in, in the right timing is really what carries us through. A lot of times we start thinking about and we focus heavily on the burdens that we're bearing and we're not focused on the power of God to lift those burdens off of our shoulders and how that that burden really does need to be carried by God, by, by Jesus Christ, by our Heavenly Father, and that burden is not meant to be carried by us alone. So the first truth that Jesus makes very clear, number one, God cares more. One of the reasons why this was such uh, a heart-wrenching moment for Mary and Martha is, is because of this. They loved Lazarus so much. And because they loved him so much and he was their older brother and he, was, he, he owned the house they lived in and so they relied on him. And I'm sure he probably, as a big brother, took great care of his sisters. And so, and the truth is, if you think about it, once he passed away, everything he owned likely would have gone straight to them. And so that, that was of no real priority in their life. They didn't really even consider any of the fact that, that if he was leaving this earth, that they would be cared for by the fact that his resources would be left to help them. That wasn't even part of the conversation. All they cared about is that they loved their brother and, and they wanted their brother with them. But God cares more. You see, when they sent the message to um, Jesus in the very beginning, they sent the message to Jesus and said, um, our brother whom you love is sick. I want you to think about the choice of words. They didn't say, our brother who loves you is sick. They didn't say, our brother who we love is sick. They said, our brother who you love is sick and he needs you. And I want you to understand that God cares more. If you think that, the, again, more of the story is focused on the characters that were around Lazarus, not so much Lazarus. So is it not true that, that the burdens that we bear throughout life a lot of times are the heaviest for the people that are around us, the people we love, the people we're connected to? And we wonder why, if we love this person and they're this important to us, then why is the Lord not stepping in? And yet he was, he was stepping in and he did have a plan. But in times of trial, it's very important to understand, if you think this matters to you, this matters to Jesus Christ a million times more than it matters to you. And it's really easy to interpret sometimes God's lack of movement as a lack of care. And I think that's one of the lies that Satan would love for you and I to believe is that God's lack of movement, according to our timetable, um, is, is a sign of his lack of care when actually it's just the opposite. In times of trial, God cares more. The more you care, the heavier your cross. Mary and Martha um, were siblings living together, as I've already said. They lived in what I think Jesus would have described as a very decent, well-ordered, um, spiritually warm climate in their own home. This was a, a brother and two sisters who actually had a close relationship with Jesus. I mean, Mary had just anointed his, his feet and, and wiped them with her hair. And, you know, J Jesus cared very deeply about Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. Now, Jesus 
is, is God. He was the Son of God. He is God. But in his humanity, while he was living on this earth, does it make sense that the human side is that he had... Um, he may have had more of a connection to certain people, humanly, physically, to be in their home. It's like if we were living that t- during that time, it makes sense that geographically there were some people he had been in their home multiple times. There were other people he loved them as much, but he'd never been in their home. His, on the humanity side of Jesus, he had a connection to these three that was different. As a matter of fact, the connection he had to these three was actually pretty intimate. And, and so he understood the concern and the burden that they bore. And here's what you need to understand. The more you care, the heavier your cross. There's a lot of people that they can kind of float above it all. They, they can move through life. They don't get too connected. They don't get too involved. They don't get too intertwined with other people and other people's problems and so forth. I think most of the time those are called men, okay? <laughs> and so then there's the other side. Those are called women. And so, but, no, I'm kidding because on both sides we all have some of this. But if, if you care, and you're supposed to care, if you love Jesus, and through that love he has given you this deeper capacity that you love people, and I mean you love people deeply, you need to understand that part of the, of the price we pay for caring so much is that our cross gets really heavy. Jesus cares in times of trial. And the more you care, the heavier your cross is going to be. And when God delays, you need to be open to the comforters. In verse 19, he mentions that there were many Jews that had assembled around Mary and Martha during this four days, and they were there to be their comforters. You see that in verse 19. During this time of waiting, while you're waiting on Jesus to show up, it's very important that you be receptive and open to comforters. God will allow people into your life. As a matter of fact, he'll draw people. He won't just allow them. He will draw people into your life to become a a strong circle of support And those people are there for a purpose, to bring you comfort. And you need to be receptive and open to the comfort that God provides while you're waiting on Jesus to show up and give you an answer. As a matter of fact, on the other side of that, you also need to be good at becoming a comforter. You need to become better at comforting people who are going through difficult times. And just learning how to develop a little bit more of that relationship skill of communicating words of support and prayer. You know, more than just click on Facebook praying for you, you know, which we all do. I do. We all do. My wife and I talk about this sometimes. Like, so do I keep doing that? Or do I quit doing that? Because sometimes that doesn't seem like, that's not supposed to be just that. Well, I think we can keep doing that. But when you keep doing that, why don't you do like my, my Bible reading strategy? Why don't you, you, don't, you don't have to go drop to your knees and pray for an hour, but why don't you just pause right where you are immediately and pray for them? So we need to be a comforter, and we need to also be open to receiving the comfort that, that Christ provides from our, our circle while we're waiting on him to show up. And when you see him, understand this, at some point, Jesus shows up. He always shows up. And when he shows up, then you will understand his love. In chapter 11, in verse 33 through verse 36, um, you see these words. When Jesus did show up, and, and not so much at first he talked to Martha, then he talked to Mary. But boy, when he talked to Mary, there was a different response. Mary was very relational. Martha was very hands-on. And so even at the death of their brother, um, you'll see in this passage of Scripture that Martha, just like she was before when, when Mary was uh, anointing his, washing his feet and, and wiping his feet with her hair, and Martha was busy doing something else. And so Martha was kind of like Mary. You know, we have work to do. That's expensive. <laughs> and, and Mary was like, no, this is, this is the work. 
It's about a relationship with Jesus. So, Mar- so Mary had to help Martha see something. It's about a relationship with Jesus. But now Martha had to help Mary see something. Because Martha was busy doing things when Jesus showed up. And so she was the first one. She heard he was coming. So she ran outside the, the town to go meet him. And she had a conversation with Jesus about, you know, where, he's, where have you been? If you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died and so forth. And Jesus reminded her that he was the resurrection. He is the life. He is the giver of life. He's not the provider of death. And so he helped set Martha's uh, heart and mind back spiritually on a kingdom focus. And then Martha came and said, Mary, Jesus is here and uh, you need to talk to him. And so, so now when he saw Mary, Mar- I, I, I would imagine that in this moment, Martha was um, grieving by staying really busy. You know what I mean? Some people, when they're hurting, they just get busier. They do more. They work more. They just, I gotta go make, I gotta go make some food. I need to go clean the house. I need to go do this. I need to go do that. I'm just, that's how you cope. You just get busier. That's what Martha did. Then you got Mary, who is very relational. So Mary, Martha was out and she ran to Jesus first. And then Mary, she was in the house just grieving. You know, Mary was, um, if you can imagine, she was probably a little more melancholy and could probably very easily slip into a deeper level of grief and despair and maybe even depression. So I guess this is important because we all have different temperaments. And so Mary had this great strength, the strength of caring. And sometimes your greatest strength can become a weakness. And Martha had this great strength, the strength of serving and doing. And sometimes even in your greatest strength, that could become your weakness and, or a blind spot. So in both scenarios and in your life and mine, you know, thank God for the tremendous strengths that he has given us. But always remember that the greatest strength that you have a lot of times can become a handicap if you don't, if you don't discipline and balance and put into perspective that I'm not relying on any of this. I'm thanking God for it and using God's strengths and gifts he's given me, but I'm not relying on any of this. I am only relying on the Lord Jesus Christ with a kingdom view to keep me moving forward and cope in the worst of times. So remember this, when the worst of the worst takes place, God cares more. Secondly, God cares more but God's timing is always better. In chapter 11, in verse 5 and 6, it says that when they received the word from Martha, when Jesus received the word from Martha that their brother was ill, it says that he remained two days longer. He hung out with his disciples two days longer. Why in the world would he wait? It, it was about a two days journey walking because... You know, they walked back then. And so if he was two days away and Lazarus was ill, and and probably he died that day that Jesus received the message. So if he's two days away and Lazarus is dying, why would Jesus deliberately make a decision to linger two more days? So his lingering two more days and then traveling two days puts him four days out. And when he arrived, Lazarus had been dead for exactly four days. You know, when he came to Martha, Martha's first words were, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But here's what we need to understand about God's timing. The longer he lingers, the greater his love. Jesus lingered on purpose. He, there's two statements I'm going to give you. One is incorrect and one is correct. The first statement is this. Jesus loved them, but he lingered. The fact that we're saying he loved them, but, is actually an incorrect statement. Jesus loved them, but he lingered. The correct statement is this. Jesus lingered because he loved them. Jesus waited because he loved them. Now, that's hard for us to comprehend, but the reality is that Jesus so loved and admired the strength of their faith and the relationship that he had with them, 
he actually lingered an extra two days because the longer he lingered, the greater his love. And secondly, under this, about his timing, the greater the miracle. You see, if Jesus would have shown up right away, and let's say Lazarus was asleep. Let's just say, for example, that Lazarus had been sick for several days, and he um, couldn't even sleep. Have you ever been that way or know somebody that they were so sick and uncomfortable, and you would say, and they haven't slept for days? So what if Lazarus had been sick and hadn't slept for days, and now he, now he was asleep, and they were having a hard time getting him back out of sleep. In other words, he was so exhausted, now he's been sleeping for days. So what if Jesus came quickly, and what he actually ended up doing is that he woke him up when, other, when they just didn't seem to have any success getting him awake. It would be like, um, you know, someone who's just really in the fog and they've been deeply ill, but then when the right person comes into the room, you, you know what I mean. It's like the right person shows up. Maybe it's the grandson. Maybe it's the new baby. Maybe it's the, the beloved daughter that's always been so close. But when that person walked in the room, all of a sudden they woke up and were more alert because of a connection to this person. Well, the longer the delay, the greater the miracle. Jesus didn't show up in time to wake him up. Jesus didn't show up in time to resuscitate him because he had just lost a pulse. Jesus didn't show up just in time to bring him back, and he, he just slipped away ten, five, ten minutes ago. Jesus didn't show up to just bring him back, resuscitate him, or wake him up. Jesus showed up after he had been dead for four days and smelled in a tomb behind a stone. The greater the delay, the greater his love, and the greater the delay, the greater the miracle. And what Jesus wanted to do for Mary and Martha was something that he was not choosing to do for any of the rest of their friends. He wanted to perform the greater miracle, like our grandson is three years old, okay, and he says some very funny things. <laughs> and between, you know, Paw Patrol and Spider-Man, he gets a lot of quotes locked in his head. Now, he's three years old, and one of his new things is, He'll just look at something and he'll say, well, I've never seen that before. <laughs> so, you know, at what, three years old, I've never seen that before. And, you know, that's what this is. Jesus, he literally wanted to create such a miracle that all of Mary and Martha and Lazarus' friends would say, I have never, ever seen anything like this before. You know, sometimes the severity of our trial and the depth of our love even for another person in the midst of a trial. God may delay a little longer because in his delay, the miracle grows bigger and the love is actually bigger. And so when he does come, and he will come, when he does come, he will perform something in your life that will be so magnified, like the difference between waking Lazarus and raising him from the dead four days later. There's a huge difference that the miracle will be so magnified, then God will be so glorified through your life and your testimony that will last for the rest of your life. People will talk about the fact that they saw the strength of your faith in the midst of a trial, that it was not some normal thing. It was so magnified and it was so much grander than anything they've ever heard of before. And that's exactly what Jesus was doing. His his timing was not a delay out of a lack of love. His timing was a delay out of the depth of his love. And the longer he lingered, the greater his love was displayed. And when he did come, the one thing it's, that it says is that they ran to Jesus. When Martha saw Jesus, she, she was told that Jesus was near, so she ran out. She actually ran out to meet him. But the Bible says when she heard Jesus was near, she ran to meet him. Then it goes on to say when Mary heard that Jesus was near, she ran to meet him. Now, I don't know what's going on in your life today, and I don't know, I don't know the depth of, of pain you might have felt. But I will tell you this, that Jesus is coming. 
He, you may not see him right now, and he may not be on your timetable, but I will promise you, he is coming. And when he does show his presence to you, it's really important that you do this, that you run to Jesus. There's a lot of people, you know, when we get disappointed by humans um, and they show up late, what, what do you feel? Well, I don't know about you, but I'm not that spiritual, Mick. So I would say, oh, really? So now you showed up? Can't you imagine that that might have gone through their mind? Like, what? So where were you four days ago? Like, now you showed up? I mean, the damage is done. It's too late. He's gone. Where were you four days ago? You know, all right, Jesus. I mean, I know we've had our moments and our, our good times, but... Right now, I'm not feeling it, right? And I'm not really that excited about you showing up right now. And we can stiff arm Jesus. Don't, and don't, don't, don't tell me that you have not done this. We can stiff arm Jesus because we're not okay. We're not okay with we think he didn't care. And we're not okay with the fact that we think he moved too slow. And we're not okay because we don't understand the purpose behind it. And our, th- our thought is that the purpose behind it is there's just no purpose for this. Am I not spiritual enough? Do you have to put me through more? We think that's the purpose. It's not the purpose. So when Jesus does show up, you need to run to him, not away from him. Jennifer and I have been in youth ministry 35 years, but about 15 years ago, we started this new ministry um, it was, it, it's kind of a faith ministry, which means, um, you know, you have no paycheck. <laughs> and, so, and so the first few years when we got off the ground, it took us about three or four years to get, you know, j- just like anything. It just took a while. But I thought, you know, I've been a youth pastor 20 years and it's just going to be smooth sailing. I mean, you know, I'm in a church of a thousand people and a bunch of people have a lot of money and You know, we're all so spiritual and we love Jesus, so all I need is just a few people to get behind this and we'll be smooth sailing. Well, you know, that didn't really work. And so so we got it was really rough for the first three or four years. And and one time we were just completely we had nothing. I mean we had absolutely nothing. We were behind on our mortgage, we were behind on our house, uh, our utility payments, and I mean we just didn't have anything. And so I prayed and prayed and prayed, like by this Friday, I mean if something doesn't come in, and we were sending out, you know, our missionary letters, and we were letting people know, um, and, you know, that we, we were asking, I'm asking God to provide our needs. What I'm really saying is, you have money, and I don't give me some money. <laughs> so, so that's what I felt like I was saying. But anyway, the, it just, so I thought, well, you know what, I'm a man of faith, so by Friday, you know, it, it's going to be here. And so, I mean, there were times when one time we really needed some groceries, and so, I mean, all day I kept thinking, I've got to get to the store today and get some food. I mean, we were, it was getting that bad. And that evening, some people from our church just showed up at the door with some boxes of groceries, and they just said, here we go, we just, we just wanted to bring you some, maybe this would help. And it was exactly that same day. And then there was another day when um, our electric bill was due, and I don't know, what the, let's say it was $269.50, right? So I prayed and prayed and prayed that by this Friday, by the day it was due, and this wasn't really the day it was due, it was past due. This was the red, this was the red bill, you know, the, with the red writing on it. <laughs> if you don't know, I'll explain it to you later. But the one with the red writing means that by this date, you know, by 5 o'clock, if you don't pay it, you will not have electricity. So it was one of those bills. And so, you know, let's say it was $2 and, I mean, $269.50. And so I prayed and prayed. And so Friday morning, I went to the mailbox and I opened the mailbox and guess what was in the mailbox? Absolutely nothing. And so, <laughs> so the electricity got turned off and uh, we spent some time in the dark and, and the heat got turned off. And, you know, but here's the thing. A few days later, we were back up and running, and here, 15 years later, I'm here to tell you, does that even matter now? It doesn't. So everything just doesn't work the way you think it's going to work. But I will tell you this, Jesus is on the way. 
And because he is on the way, when he does show up, you need to run toward him. Let's pray.